when you take your seats, please do come forward. It's really nice for speakers when they see faces in the front rows. Put your hand up if you're younger than 20 in this room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do we have any young students in this room? Young students. They're too busy chatting or on their phones. Okay, take your seats, good people. We're about to begin. Take your seats. Okay, nobody's listening to take your seats. You're all brilliant. You just have to be brilliant in your seats. That's the only thing. Okay, right. I have the go-ahead that we can play our jingle. So let's play our jingle and let's get stuck in, please. Take your seats, good people. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome for the first time. I'm saying this for those who may just have joined us for the ride in this room or online. Here we are at our EU Mission Ocean event. We're focusing on the efforts, the actions, the brilliance, the sweat, blood and tears of all of those working to progress under the umbrella of the Mediterranean Lighthouse, the EU Mission Goals. Now, this part of our event features three short sessions ahead of lunch. Now, I think we're not going to come into lunch too late. 1.30 as opposed to 1.15, okay? But I depend upon our speakers to be beautifully dynamic. Now, let's do a poll first, and then let's hear from some framing statements from the Commission, and then I will ask our speakers to come and join me. Let's do a poll. When I think about the pollution of our ocean and waters, what worries me most is what? So. Thank you very much to the technical team for keeping that QR code there. That's great. And hopefully we have enough people to provide a decent outcome to this poll. So when I think about the pollution of our ocean and waters, what worries me the most is pollution on board ships, plastic, ghost nets, public waste left on beaches, chemical and, I could add, their chemical and agricultural pollution. Let's put those two together. Of course, these overlap, but what keeps you most awake at night? Chemical and agricultural pollution, plastic waste, pollution on board ships, what the public leave behind on beaches, ghost nets. What is your absolute prevailing concern. So at the moment, we see plastic waste followed by chemical and agricultural pollution. But there is a clear winning worry. Okay, well, in a way, that's not good, but it does preempt what we're going to be talking about next. We are going to look at leading actions for the reduction of pollution. So, litter at sea, microplastics released into the environment, nutrient losses, the use, the risk of chemical pesticides, pollution in general, okay? We won't have so much time for questions. If you've got a burning one in the room, raise your hand, but make sure it's brilliant, please. Let me first invite to join me from the Commission from DG Research and Innovation, the Director of Healthy Planet and the Deputy Mission Manager, he's already been up here a few times, John Bell. Now you get to go there, John. A warm round of applause. So apparently to keep you awake, you need to be entertained. I now apologize for an Irish man speaking Italian. It's Italian I'm trying to speak here. Uh, buongiorno eh, a tutti voi. Vorrei ringraziare Assessore Tamajo, Sindaco La Gala, il Presidente Galvagno e naturalmente anche i Ministri. Questo palazzo è il cuore della storia del Mediterraneo. Palermo e il Mediterraneo sono il cuore della civiltà. Questa missione da chi dal Mediterraneo continuerà il suo viaggio verso il futuro. Uh, grazie mille and thank you for your very warm welcome. How could we not be inspired after the three stories we've just seen? Um, this is 
uh, our Mediterranean, but this is your mission. And the mission are the people who are living wherever they're living, however they're living, depending as we all are on the, on the life of the sea and the ocean. Um, if we look at the Trinacia here on the flag of Sicily, we can think also like Medusa did at the beginning in, in founding this part of uh, uh, the culture of, of Italy, that there are three things we need to make our ocean, our future go round. We need to restore the health of our ecosystems. We need to make sure that we have um, a climate neutral uh, environment for our economy around the sea. Uh, and of course, we need to deal with the issue of pollution and it's no longer enough and Pascal Lamy and the, the team of the board who've done such a great job, we're not going to replace the starfish with the, the Trinacia, don't worry, Pascal. But we will officially announce, announce that the Commission is very happy with the starfish while we're here. Um, the mission is not about identifying all the problems that we have, we know about that. It's about mapping the next vision of where we are going to live and work together, which is a world without pollution, which is a healthy sea, uh, which, is an, uh, which is an economy and a society that is living with nature, um, that is living with a prosperous society where people want to live in the way that they want to live. And when we think about uh, the challenges that we're facing, anxiety is not a policy. Uh, not too far away from here, in 1955, a group of dreamers went to a place called Messina and in that place, they decided that there should be a different Europe and people laughed at them. In fact, some people left the room, not for the first time. Um, Messina was where the idea of the European Union was born. And in many ways, the Mediterranean, as it has been for European civilization, it is where Europe begins. And this is where Europe begins again. Our task to make peace with nature begins with our Mare Nostrum, begins with our ocean. And so the Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean, is our European sea that we share with our neighbours on all sides. But the mission is your mission to work out how we get to the version of this sea uh, that is without pollution, that is uh, in, in, in health of its ecosystems and where the economy and the life of the people who live around the sea are at one with a climate neutral future. That's a no pressure request. So you'll hear many presentations now, many of which will ring and chime with the big reports that we've seen on what's happening with plastics. The OECD has shown us um, the situation. We will see there are different kinds of pollution. And the issue of the mission is to think about how we are going to get to that map that we have in our minds of what these seas and oceans looks like. For the European Union, where we've had to learn that we're part of a geographical reality uh, in many ways, we must become an ocean union. We must become a European Union that understands and internalizes that these great transitions that we have on ecosystems and climate, in society, in work, in where people live and so forth, have to begin with the great system of the ocean that defines so many of our uh, issues and, and uh, challenges. So you'll hear from many different people here today who are here to inspire us, how it is that real people living in real places are making the changes happen. There is a different Europe that is already there that is forming, as there was in Messina in 1955. Our task in the European Union now is to make peace with nature. And the business of making peace with nature is to change from the business as usual approaches, because if we continue with business as usual, there'll be neither business and nothing will be usual. So we need to move into a different kind of way of living uh, in, in keeping with what people need in a fair and just society. I was extraordinarily uh, struck by the, diff the, the diversity of the way in which people, not only how people live, but people find solutions where they live. I've never seen circular monasticism before. We look at uh, this extraordinary project from Tunisia. The Mediterranean is a shared space, and not only are our neighbors in Tunisia restoring uh, the ecosystems, but they're using it as a means of including people who find it very difficult to be included in their society. Restoration is also a social act. And of course, on an island that it attempts to be uh, blue, doesn't matter how small or how large, everything is possible. And this is the purpose of the mission. 
is to give courage to people in policy, in places, to give support and resources. The Commission's task, the big programme's task, are to support you. We are not the mission, you are the mission. And our job is to give you what you need to make these transitions happen. And I thank our colleagues working in the Coordination Support Action Blue Mission Med who are there to help you. So you've seen and heard a lot, you'll hear some more. It's a whistle-stop tour of hope. We hear a lot of difficult messages the whole time about just how challenging the world is. We need to give courage to politics, hope to citizens, space to innovation, and respite to nature, and we'll do it where we live and work, not in other places with other people's responsibilities. We are all, of course, citizens of the ocean. Uh, as the ocean and the water system reminds us, uh, it is not going to go away, and we should believe that we can actually begin the process of transforming uh, the future, not just of future generations, but of our own society, restoring the economic, environmental and social health of our society in a place that has begun in an island of hope in Messina in 1955. Gracie Miller, thank you very much. Thank you. Who, who, who in this room is tweeting? Is anyone tweeting? There were some good quotes there, weren't there? You can always rely upon John Bell. I particularly liked anxiety is not a policy. Did you say yes? Indeed. Restoration is also a social act. Indeed. And it ain't business as usual, because if it is, there's no business and it certainly ain't usual. So thank you and for all your other very clear, warm words. Um, now, Please join me from the Joint Research Centre, Head of Unit Ocean and Water, Jan Martinson. A very warm round of applause for this gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm working for the Joint Research Centre, Director General of the European Commission. It is our job to provide best available scientific advice to EU policies. A classical example is, uh, is the support we provide to the common fisheries policy, their scientific advice is a legal requirement. I'd like to believe, and thank you actually, Joanna, John, Kestutis, for having me here, that we are really sisters in arms trying to tackle the challenges we face together. Ogni volta che sono in Sicilia mi toglie il fiato, incredibile. Sono stato qui qualche mese fa e l'ambiente, l'atmosfera è veramente unico. It is great that we have the opportunity to meet here. And I'm really, every time I'm in Sicily, it takes my breath. And I think it's such a paradigm for where we want to go through in the European Union. And then I go to the beaches. And honestly, also there, my breath is sometimes taken. The amount of litter beach I see also here in Sicily is amazing. I was in a minority in this poll. I belong to the 2% who, who said that actually litter beach is really something that worries me. And it does, because we want to move towards concrete solutions. And apparently, individually, we are not even able to care for the most obvious taking away the litter from the beaches. It is clear when we look around that we look at a triple crisis, not only pollution, but also climate change and biodiversity decline. We saw that so clearly in the Oda River disaster, the river warming, low river levels, uh, concentration of pollutants, algae, toxic algae growth led to the dying of tons and tons of fish. I invite you to read a recent report we did together with DGN and the European Environment Agency analyzing what has happened there, which is really quite throwing some light on a phenomenon which we see more and more often. Why do I say this? Because I sincerely believe we have to tackle pollution in an integrated fashion. We cannot look at pollution alone. Now we, the Joint Research Center, we do this from a scientific point of view. And we are very data hungry. Scientists are starving for data. We need this to analyze. We would like to use data that we accumulate on member state basis, but also from you, and I will come to that, in order to not only see what is happening now, but also, for example, in the Zero Pollution Outlook report that we published in December this year and that will be republished in 24, what will happen in the future? Scientists, often people say, well, come on. You model and then you say, tell us what is happening in 100 years. So what? 
We became very brave. Actually, what we're doing under the remit of the Zero Pollution Action Plan is we look into 2030 at different policy scenarios under the remit of EU legislation and Zero Pollution, the Zero Pollution Action Plan and see what happens to plastic chemicals coming from the rivers going into the sea. One example, we looked into pesticide influx from the river systems into the Black Sea. We developed certain climate change scenarios and looked whether we can expect or not under different scenarios to reach the zero pollution targets or not. You can read all this in our reports. Recently, I have the feeling in Europe and worldwide, the discussion shifts a little bit. We are talking about the Green Deal and its implementation and recently also about the Blue Deal. But it seems that we are also getting more and more concerned about what does it cost for us to come to create a sustainable future. Will it allow us to continue living in prosperity? This is why I believe it is also important as another level to link our analysis under the European Green Deal to economic, and this was mentioned also before, aspects. For us, this means that we look into the blue economy. How can we make the best of ocean resources in a sustainable way? And I'd like you to invite to visit our EU um, Blue Economy Observatory and to engage with us. We already do this with Portugal, France and Italy, and we would like to engage with more member states. Final statement, Katina, I will finish then. I started out by saying everyone can be involved. We have developed so-called apps, on one hand for invasive alien species, where every one of us can contribute to better understand when it comes to some sort of pollution, that is the introduction of invasive alien species in the Mediterranean, for example. And we will soon publish a marine litter app, again, that every one of us can use in order to create data for scientists, in order to help us citizens together to move towards a prosperous and green and blue future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. There you go, and there's another one to put out there. Scientists are starving for data, but thank you. Do really have a look at what is being produced. Um, fantastic, thank you for speaking with such passion and eloquence. Right, national projects, programs, initiatives, that's what we're going to hear from that are working to reduce pollution. But we have someone first to headline this part of the session, uh, Giovanni Cano. He is Rear Admiral, Head of Plans and Operations at the Department of Italian Coast Guard Headquarters. And we're going to hear a little bit more about what the Coast Guard does because we might be a little bit surprised at the amount of actions, particularly in this area. So the next five minutes are yours, please, sir. You can also give a round of applause and a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your strong presentation. The same strength that we have to put in this uh, EU, EU, EU project. The history of the relationship between Italian and Coast Guard and protection of the sea is attested by the date of the norms that have conferred the function of guardians of the blue patrimony of our peninsula. In 1982, the legislator assigned to maritime authority the task of arranging all the necessary measures to eliminate or mitigate the effects of a concrete marine pollution or only potential by assigning the supervisory function to the first 20 protected marine areas. More than 40 years have passed, and the activities for the protection of the sea have evolved, as the Italian Coast Guard did, with the acquisition of cutting-edge tools and technologies, the realization of a dedicated laboratory managed by highly qualified personnel, the establishment of a department directly attached to the decastry of the environment with the creation of, of a structure within the Coast Guard headquarters specifically dedicated to the prevention and repression of environmental crimes. Since the human element is always the key factor in achieving the planet goals, the Italian Coast Guard invests in the training of its personnel through courses held in their own graduate school in Livorno and promotes all initiatives aimed at spreading and increasing in society the culture of protection of the marine environment. The work takes place both on land and at sea. 
because the two environments are deeply connected. Shore-based inspections and verifications involve activities that have consequences that are directly apparent at sea. A significant part of the disease of the sea is due to land activities much more than those taking place on the sea. In this context, the Italian Coast Guard with environmental policy units located throughout the country, in addition to daily verification activities, conducts control operations focused on domestic and industrial waste water discharging into water bodies flushed at sea, which have led to numerous referrals to local judicial authorities. Jurisdiction with, uh, moreover, a stance to any offense uh, committed in the matter of waste. Pollution prevention at sea takes place through careful monitoring with sophisticated software of the entire mention traffic uh, that passes through the Mediterranean and the emergency response takes place uh, through continuously improved plans involving a large number of authorities. Thanks to the cooperation with the European Maritime Safety Agency and the sharing of the information acquired with the modern system available, reaction times are extremely reduced. At the same time, the maritime area of interest has expanded, first with the establishment of ecological protection zones and then with a buffer zone. Experience has shown that, in some cases, Cooperation between several states is needed to meet the common need to protect the marine environment. We therefore need international instruments such as multilateral agreements and interregional projects aimed at pooling the necessary resources. Italy and the Italian Coast Guard operate constantly and concretely for this purpose. The integrity of the environment is also protected through national committees for the safety of offshore oil and gas operations. The agreements with the Ministry of the Environment allow to have adequate financial resources to control the offshore platform on national interest, ensuring a vigilant and professional presence. Marine protected areas are seen as an interesting driving force for the local economy, thanks to the modern regulations that respond to posi positively to the environmental and socioeconomic needs. As we said at the beginning, the Italian Coast Guard, in its functional defense of Ministry of the Environment and Energy Security, which operates both with convention and with the specific uh, budget chapters, is placed to guard these increasingly extensive and numerous areas. The sea, then, is a natural environment of many fish species, some suffering from commercial overfishing, as attested by European and international scientific studies. The Coast Guard, in its capacity and uh, as a national fisheries control center, ensures compliance with community rules, including through continuous cooperation with the components competent European agency based in Vigo. Last but not least, the new sensibility or the environmental issues, the awareness of the importance of sustainability or the activities on the sea led the Corp to open up to collaborations with associations and with the civil world, from the protection of sharks to the recovery of ghost nets, to the identification and disposal on land of waste caught or identified in the most sensitive areas a matter that Italy has, in far-sighted manner, regulated by a recent law. In conclusion, the naval, air, underwater and land components of the Italian Coast Guard are daily engaged in complex activities of awareness and control over the environment as sentinels of our seas. The modernization of the system and the tools available, as well as the use of new technologies, allows to affirm that the Italian Coast Guard is ready for the future challenges that the, community, that the community will have to face in the next few years, with more and more passion, professionalism and commitment. Thank you to all.
Thank you very much. And uh, very reassuring to hear that this culture of protection and restoration of the marine environment is so very much in what you are training up and handing on to the next generation. Thank you so very much. You may take your seat. Warm thanks. Ah, you had a short video. Uh, I, oh, I don't know about any short video, but there we now have a short. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now it's good English. Thank you. You are a very busy gentleman and your team. Actually, just a quick read of the room. Who would be surprised to learn about absolutely everything that the Coast Guard is responsible for and engaged in? Who, who's surprised? I cannot believe you all knew it was that breadth of activities. Well, thank you, because you opened my eyes. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are now coming to, we're gonna showcase these national projects. We're still staying with reduction of pollution in all its forms. Can I invite, there are two people who are in this room and there are two people online, although we will not meet them until I ask them to please um, speak with you. But can I ask please now to come forward mission board member Spiros Kouvelis. And also in the room, we have Daniela Maric van Kuchen, who is, well, all sorts of things coming from Interreg Italy, Croatia. But you need to sit, I would put you here, Spiros. And if, yep, here is a good one. It's very grand. You look like royalty together. This could be another royal wedding, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just say? Here we go. Okay. So. We also have, as you see online, we have the co-founder of Plastic at Sea, who we will meet shortly. Ah, there we have her. We have uh, Annalela uh, Meisterzheim, and we also uh, have online Berenger Prince, and she is bringing the perspective. She is a lead natural resources management specialist at the World Bank. Now, I will come to you good ladies in a moment, but I am going to start uh, with Spiros. He is founder and director of the Institute for Sustainable Development of the European Public Law Organization, uh, has a lot of different hats, but critically is an EU mission board member. I don't know what's your favorite hat to wear, but that's the one you're coming with today. So let me turn to you first and tell a colorful story spotlighting what's happening at national level. What are you most proud of? Thank you, Katrina, and thank you to everyone for inviting me to this amazing place. Um, I have chosen to speak about two examples that are both signatories of the uh, mission and the mission charter, I mean. The first one comes from the Lascarides Foundation in Greece, 
and it's none else than the Typhoon project, which is what you see in the picture. Typhoon is the boat you see in the picture. Um, it's a project that started in 2019, and the aim is of cleaning the entire Greek coastline. So the Typhoon, which is a 72-meter ship, sails all year round, 365, uh, cleaning and transporting the collected waste to recycling or proper disposal structures. The program has been running for three and a half years, and the total cleanup it has so far done is 480 tons of plastic litter from beaches. Now, what is interesting here is that this first round of the three and a half years has collected and taken away all the historical deposition of plastic and other waste on the beaches. And now then the second round is starting, it's very interesting that we will monitor, I mean, the, the foundation will monitor what is the, the, the depositions from here onwards. So what new waste, what new plastic is being deposited on the beaches, which allows us to monitor what is really happening, what are the trends and the tendencies. And this is a very important project because it collects all the waste, but besides collecting what is there, it's even better to not have the waste in place. If we can go to the next page, this is what happens on the deck of the Typhoon project. So with the five inflatable boats they have, they go out, collect everything, and then sort it out, do the triage, and do the analysis with the research foundation. And if we go to the next one, we'll go to the island of Tilos. Tilos is a small island in the Dodecanese, in the Aegean Sea. Tilos has a population in winter of, seven, of uh, 745 people. In summer, it has 13,000 visitors. That is an increase of 1,745% of the, of the increase, 17 and a half times up. And what happened in Tilos is that the other foundation, we cannot see the screen, so what happens with uh, the Poly Green Foundation is that they have eliminated the landfills and public dustbins, and they now do the sorting at source and door-to-door -door collection and lead everything to composting, recycling, and reusing. What is interesting is that every visitor upon arrival on the island will find the information and equipment needed to do this kind of sorting. And if you arrive by a sailboat or speedboat, you will also find special QR codes on the port where you know exactly how to do it. And every person that lives or is a visitor on the island has an app on their phone that allows them to report, monitor, and know exactly what has happened in their own waste stream. Just two numbers and I'm finishing because I know that we're short of time. All right. I always speak very fast. We had a problem with the, sorry, we had a problem with the electricity. We seem to, yeah. so we are getting it back. Hopefully we'll be able to show other presentations. So I'll go slow. Just a little bit so slower. So that we get to see the pictures because the you're pictures gonna from, kill them, Baxter. You're from kill Tilos are very interesting. Okay. Now, besides all of this uh, armor, let's say, of applications, QR codes and everything, what has happened is that the old landfill has been totally closed, as I said before, and transformed. So now it is equipped and operates as a center for circular innovation, which is a visiting place for schools, for young people, not only from the island, but from many different parts of the country and other countries. And what happened is that through this continued training and awareness and continuous pressure, if you like, there has been a recorded through the app uh, decline, or if you like, a reduction of waste production of 30%. Volume. 30% means, with a quick calculation, that if you do that per 13,000 people every year, that means at least 20 tons less waste produced. 20 tons in one small island. Can we maybe try to show a couple of pictures of oh, this from uh, the Trine Steel? Yeah. Come back so, at the end. While, while I'm having the floor and the pictures are coming, what is important to note here is that we have two things. One thing is that we need to collect what is out there, know where the waste comes from. The second is to do everything we can to reduce waste production and to lead it to full circularity. Uh, I mean, taking the, the, the waste out and just bringing it somewhere else is not a solution. Not having it is the solution. I'll stop here. If we can show the pictures from Tilos, They're I think trying, people will. But there is there electricity issues, I promise. Okay, they haven't just all gone for a tea break. Again, it needs to be really concise. It needs to be a couple of sentences, something just important before I turn to the lady on your right. Um, scale up. We heard about this a lot yesterday. We heard about it in terms of SMEs. We heard about it in general with projects. Um, what sort of scaling do we need 
for the examples that you showed us, if we can expect to really tackle this massive issue in the Mediterranean pollution, what do we need? I think, I think as we saw in the examples of all the awards that we gave before, um, we need to move from the phase of just collecting to the phase of not producing, to yeah. the phase of full circular, circularity. Islands are very good for this yeah. they're, because they're contained places. Yeah. And I think that if we start moving to a, a notion that says waste is not waste, it's raw materials. Yeah. We have to forget the word waste in our minds. Okay. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. And as so many that have gone before you have said, it's a paradigm shift. It's a cultural shift. It's a shift in thinking. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniela, Daniela Maric van Kuchen, van Kuchen uh, is a senior research associate, is that correct, at the Ruda Boscovic Institute for Marine Research in Rovinj in Croatia. I know it's tricky because you are part of an interreg program that does so much. Uh, this is very much in your DNA. So just highlight a few things that we can have an idea at national level to complement what we heard earlier is happening in Croatia. Thank you for your nice introduction. So I'm a scientist, but I'm not going to talk about my science today. I'm going to present a program which is for, very important for my country, but also for Italy. So it's a joint uh, Italy-Croatia program, which was going on from 2014 until 2020, and in which was uh, more than 230 million euro were um, among uh, 97 projects distributed. Wow. In this uh, 97 project, there were more than 800 partners. Research institutes, uh, regions, cities, all possible uh, small-scale uh, interpreters. You, you can't imagine the variety of these partners. And this is something that is really nice for the Interact project because it brings together science, but also stakeholders and the users and the citizens and the cities. Uh, important for this uh, was also that we had a very much um, uh, interaction with the regional and local stakeholders to exchange knowledge, to exchange our experiences, and to implement pilot actions and products uh, and the services, to create new business opportunities, new business models, and new politics. Uh, and the aim for all this, it was to improve the life quality and the environmental conditions for more than 12 million people living in this region. We also know that this region, Croatia and Italy, are very, very uh, interesting for tourism. So during the summer, these numbers are even much bigger. What we uh, hear a lot about the Mediterranean Sea in these two days, but I will stress out the Adriatic. The Adriatic Sea is the northernmost part of the Mediterranean, and it's very, very important. It's close, and it's a small sea, especially its uh, northern part. And being so small and so uh, shallow, we can um, see the ch climate change much faster than the, the other European seas. So we can measure uh, raising in the temperature. So northern Adriatic is very sensitive, and we are forecasting somehow the global climate change. And we should not forget the Po River, which is the second biggest river in the Mediterranean. So brings a lot of pollutants and things that come with the river. So um, Adriatic is a great indicator for early uh, climate change. But it's also very interesting because we have real in situ monitoring so we have the true digital twin, uh, twin of the ocean. Thanks to these projects, we invested a lot in the new equipment in the past three years, and we are really going uh, moving forward. As it's so small sea, we also uh, were working on a high resolution ocean models, which can be used uh, by stakeholders and by uh, society. And on this interreg uh, program, we work a lot on uh, restoration of the endangered habitats, on monitoring. We work a lot with biodiversity. We studied and monitored endangered species like Pinanobilis, which is completely disappearing from the Mediterranean, but also seagrass, 
And we were also monitoring the invasive species which are entering our sea. And last but not least, we were uh, really working a lot with Ocean Lister Sea. Just an example of one of the projects that I've been working on in the past three years, this was the Cascade project, we had more than 100 events for the schools, for the public, for the stakeholders, for the fishermen, in which we were trying to involve them in our laboratory work, in our eco actions where we were cleaning the sea floor, the beaches, and so on. And this was, uh, I would say, this was the biggest, um, uh, the biggest information that this interact gave. Th those are thousands of people who learned about the biodiversity and the threats that are actually uh, coming to, uh, which are for our ocean. And the, I would say, I would finish with this, that uh, Interreg is offering science-based solution to the community and to all of us. Thank you. Oh, I'm just... I think you have very well communicated your... Uh, they did not yeah, change. Please, your, last, just yes, the last Let picture. me just say, the problem is the storm, good people. The storm has knocked the electricity capacity. Yes. This is why we cannot no, see it. There's but one last. You have got some great slides and slides are available to the audience after this event, let me reassure you. And I had the pleasure of talking to you last night and your colleague and I can absolutely attest to how much this is in your DNA and your passion, we are working, how much, we are how much very you much. have done. Yes, and how much that reach out in terms of citizen awareness that you've had also the support yes, of the government. We have, we have very yes. strong citizen science. Last uh, year we had this uh, jellyfish bloom which was going on. We had more than 900 uh, information from the citizen science with the photos, with geolocated photos, then which we put in our monitoring program and which give us information because scientists want information. Absolutely, that's absolutely, we heard this crying and this out. Is, this and is perfect equipment. timing, we've got it back. I'm just gonna move on, I'm gonna hear from our two speakers online. Can I first please call, uh, oh, there we go. We're calling upon Anna-Leila Meisterzheim, uh, who is co-founder and I think co-founded in 2018, if I'm right, and general manager at Plastic at Sea, a doctor of marine biology. So this organization, Plastic at Sea, coordinates all sorts of, of, of projects on the study of colonization and biodegradability and the toxicity of plants at sea and all sorts of actions with other really critical stakeholders. And part of it is also dissemination of all of that knowledge to the public. I think you're going to speak more widely at national level, I hope, uh, and Leila, but let me give you the floor, please. Thank you. As you say, I'm, I'm a uh, um, marine biologist working with uh, the plastic pollution, and the, the goal is really to find solutions and to assess the best, the best alternative, alternative taking to a com scientific fact. So this is really our point, and we are working with different uh, NGO partners of uh, social insertion. We are working also a lot with citizen actions that are doing beaches or with urban screenings. And the goal is really to try to understand what is the best area, where can we really remove this plastic pollution to avoid that it will continue its travel from the river directly to the sea. So maybe you can, yeah, I don't know if you have now, the, yes, the, the, the slide. So you, as you can see, the goal is really to understand what is the best solution. So to identify them, we are doing a lot of a project in France, but also in the Balearic Islands, for example. And we have also worked in the nine main rivers uh, you know, at the European scale. And we try to identify uh, what is the fragmentation of this, uh, what is the, the main factor that will change this plastic? Is it possible to understand if this plastic that we can find also after a very clean sea is directly fragmented in the river condition due to the UV, due to the temperature, abrasion, etc., that we change this plastic pollution and so change also the methods we can uh, practice to remove this plastic before it will arrive at sea. So we identify this pollution using, for example, uh, Montanet, the thing that we use uh, at sea. We are doing also a scientific protocol that are uh, European recognized uh, to identify 
the different type of plastic of waste we will find on the river banks, as you can see there. And the goal is really to identify also the size of these plastics. And if we, I will show you, uh, if you can go directly to the next slide, this is really what I would love to show you. You can see that if we are looking to the, the Rhone River, for example, one of the main rivers of the Mediterranean Sea, you can see that we have a lot of pollution that it's linked directly to the presence of the human activities, something that we know previously. But you can also observe that the plastic pollution is mainly due of the presence of microplastics. So the microplastic, the fragmentation of the plastic waste, the plastic litter, are directly done on land and not at sea. And so to remove them, it's not possible to remove them directly from the rivers. So the goal is to find new solution on land to remove the macro plastics that represent only 10% of, uh, the, of uh, this uh, plastic pollution when we follow them on the river. So it's too late for the microplastic, but we can find new solution directly from the cities to before they, they, they go the, directly on, the, on the, the river. So the goal is really to find new solution when these plastics are deposited off incorrectly in the environment. So if you go further on the, on the slide, yes, we also use uh, infrastructures that are mainly linked on that are uh, that are deployed on these rivers and we we follow for example the different mechanic systems that are directly involved in this hydroelectric plant and what we observe is the fact that it's possible we can remove the plastic from this from this rivers taking into account the macro plastics and it's something new because it's not too late. And now we can try to find new solution directly on the cities and on the system we use, uh, the methods we use to for our plastic waste, just to avoid that it will be lost directly in the environment. So for us, the plastic, it's to, to reduce really this plastic pollution, we have first, we need to reduce the use it's something that we have all in, in our mind. After we can change also the conventional plastic by, by biodegradable and non-toxic alternative, when it's we need really to, to, to observe, for example, to obtain a, a packaging, for example. And after we can remove the plastics that, that were deposited off incorrectly, but we need to follow them inland and to apply new methods for waste collection and to make the best choice now what we need is a scientific database. We need, we need really to increase the number of citizen uh, action that will be transformed in scientific uh, participative actions just to increase the database we can, we can obtain in the scientific community and to make the best choice based on fact and not on, on, uh, on the observation only we can add at the end of the flow corresponding to the beaches. Ah, okay, thank you. I was just, thank you very, first of all, thank you very much. <laughs> super, super interesting, super interesting breakdown about, you know, how you are using this mapping, we're using the science, we're using the monitoring to come up with the solutions. Really beautifully presented, thank you so very much. Without ado, are you able to hear? Is it are you all right with the um, acoustics for our online speakers? Yeah, yeah great. It's, okay. it's harder. It's harder here where I am. Okay, so we now have Berenger Prince. As I said, she is lead natural resources management specialist at the World Bank. Um, so she's led all sorts of blue engagements as far afield as Africa, Latin America, Europe. Um, so let's hear a little bit more about what the World Bank is doing. How does it chime? How does it resonate with what the EU is doing? So I'm going to turn now to you and. Give give you the floor, Berenger. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this uh, uh, focus presentation because it that, then to really show what the solutions are. And that's what I'm going to try to do today uh, with Albania. We've been partnering with this country to address the issue of marine plastic using the blue economy development framework. What is it? It's on the screen. That's great. The, the slide is working. And that's my only slide. So that's going to be easy. It, it's a very systematic approach along three pillars. And you're going to see how I'm going to use that. So Albania, plastic, yeah, um, that's a big issue in this country. It, it has major risk on the environment, the health of the population, the country's economy. It's not the biggest contributor, but it's one of the top ones. You know, we estimate that about there is 20 kilo per person uh, of plastic pollution ending up in the Adriatic Ionian Sea from Albania. So, and, and why? It's because like other Mediterranean countries, uh, there is not uh, the ideal uh, waste management system. There is inadequate infrastructure, insufficient waste separation at the source. And, you know, most of the municipal waste end up on landfill or dump side that, you know, sometimes end up uh, for the plastic waste tend to fly off into rivers or lakes. So using this uh, beautiful blue economy development framework, we, 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 we really work very closely with Albania and we did a number of things. On pillar one, on this knowledge pillar, we uh, published uh, back in 2021 a report called Realizing the Blue Economy Potential of Albania. And, and it really helped to, you know, start to formulate a vision there. And it will help also fill knowledge gap, including on the issue of marine plastic. You know, we, we tried to put all those figures together. And more importantly, we emphasize why healthy marine and ecosystem are so important for the country. And not long after, and also because, you know, we work with so many other partners, waste management became a top government priority. And and, and that was great to see, to see, to, to, to hear the Prime Minister talking about waste with so much passion. That, that was fantastic. Not long, moving to the second pillar, policy reform, we um, we uh, pr approved in March 2023, just a few months ago, the first resilience and green development policy operation. This project includes the provision of the budget support to Albania when the government approves a new law on the extended producer responsibility. So that's really going to help shift the policy toward more circularity. And last, the pillar three on investment, uh, we are currently finalizing the preparation of the 75 million euro investment to reduce pollution from land base. For on the solid waste component, we work closely with the municipality. You know, this is really where waste management is taking place. And, and we, we're going to help them finance their waste investment plan each time they're making progress on one of three criteria, one or more. One, the waste collection coverage, the waste separation, and the fee recovery. Fee recovery being important for the sustainability of solid waste management. So I have a, a few, I have a minute to conclude. I want to go a little bit beyond Albania, uh, World Bank is also engaged in other countries. I was so interested by the presentation from Interreg because we're also working in Croatia, preparing a, a report, a multi-sectoral analysis, going sector by sector of all the blue economy. And, 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 and we are also preparing policy recommendation. In Tunisia, in Morocco, we published a year ago a strategy and action plan to reduce plastic pollution. In Morocco, we uh, started to implement last year a blue economy program. It's again a result-based approach. So each time we the, 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 the country reached some result, then there, there's the, the, the project can release the, the corresponding payment. And it's focused on the blue economy governance, you know, the cross-sectorality, which is a big thing in the blue economy, but also sustainable tourism, sustainable aquaculture and climate resilience. Last but not least, we're also very engaged in the Black Sea together with our colleague from the EU in conjunction with the Common Maritime Agenda. And this is through our Bluing the Black Sea program. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. I have to say I have to leave in 15 minutes, so I, I have to, to mention that. But thank you so much. That's over from me. Thank you very much. These are only highlights and I haven't got time to come back to our lovely speakers apart because you've been so patient. I'm just going to come back to the two of you here, but I thank you so much to our two delightful online speakers. I'm going to ask one quick question for the two who are in the room. And that quick question is, okay, 
perhaps the first bit of this is an obvious answer, is enough being done? No. We've heard about so many things that, that, that need to happen, the citizen science, the ocean literacy, the engagement. We've had examples of apps and days out and summer schools and all sorts of, of raising awareness. Political resolve, political commitment across ministerial changes, anything we haven't heard that needs to accelerate action in three sentences. First from you, Spiros, and then from you. Literally three sentences, please. Sentence one, connect what we do on the field to science. Analyze data, know what are the root causes, know how to tackle that through action. Second, connect what we're doing in terms of policy and civil society, if you like, or academia, to the business sector. Yeah. It has to make yeah, economic yeah. sense. Yeah. And that's only two. Okay, that's only two. Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and fully, you are reiterating what, what came up yesterday. Thank you very much. And last word to you. I will just repeat something that was already said before. Uh, hopes, hope to the citizen. So we have to show them that, <clears throat> sorry, that there's a way to make the things better and to restore our ocean, to restore the endangered habitats. We can do the change. Each from us, if we start from us, we can do the change. And space to the innovation, monitoring and science. Thank you. The, the two, as we heard, the two, the balance between the technology and the heart. We heard that yesterday from one of our speakers. I think it was Figan, the technological side, the human approach and telling those amazing stories. But we saw it with the winning islands. We saw it with the examples that you gave. Thank you for your patience with the storm's electrical outburst. A warm round of applause to these two good speakers and also to the lovely two ladies who joined us online. Thank you very much. I tend to have to move over there because I can't hear the speakers well here, so I have to slip off stage a bit. Now, are we feeling good in the house? We have energy to take us through to a delicious lunch, by which time hopefully you won't be drenched downstairs, okay? So what we're going to do now is just again have some of these colourful insights into some other actions that are being taken, very diverse, to support the Mission Charter. There are seven speakers, we're not going to invite them all at once. We have four who are coming up first and very helpfully because we heard from Spiros there about the Typhoon project and now we're going to hear about it in more detail. So can I invite Angeliki Kozmopoulou to please come and sit. Where can you sit? I think here is, is great. A warm welcome to you from the Athanasios Lascaridis Foundation. A warm welcome. We also have uh, Stefan Spiteri. Uh, Green Deal Malta is what we're going to hear about from Europa. We have Francesco uh, Managnoli from the Port of Ravenna Authority. You're going to be talking to us about access to Napa and something very different. Um, here's the longest title for coastal municipalities with mooring fields over Neptune seagrass beds. From Submon, we have Juanita Zoria. Please, a warm welcome. So, I think I will start with you. Now, I'm not going to repeat again, I don't want to terrify you all. You have to read the atmosphere in the room, just the fantastic highlights. But we're going to hear more about Typhoon. Is Absolutely. that correct? Absolutely. Let, okay. let me give you that. Okay. And, and let me do... So, Spiros gave you a preview, actually, about the Typhoon. Um, well, I guess that in this room, we don't have to convince one another about the urgency to tackle marine pollution. Um, we all know it. We have been discussing it way too long. And I think that we have uh, been talking a lot about the future. So what we are doing at the Athanasius uh, Silas Caridis Charitable Foundation is um, actually doing things. So we're an action-oriented foundation based in Athens, Greece, that focuses most of its energy and resources on the tackling of marine pollution. And we focus our, on all our action on four fronts. The first is field work. Spiros mentioned it briefly before. We remove litter from the Greek coastline extensively. Research, support of research, awareness raising, very important for our 
business and policy making. So we, these are the four areas that we have identified as key areas for the tackling of marine pollution and we, we work um, simultaneously on all four of them. You met the typhoon, you can see it in the background, a 72 meter long boat, um, very commanding, it's, you, know, you can tell, its presence alone. It has a staff of 35 mem members permanently and it operates daily into, into uh, shifts one after the other to remove litter from remote coastlines. So the typhoon and its boats, boats go to places where no other boat can go. So the first, um, our first aim to, is to delitter, not an easy task. If you consider that in less than four years, we have really uh, covered more than 3,000 beaches and Greece is the country that has the longest uh, shoreline in the European Union, but this is hardly enough. So if we can move to the next slide, um, de delittering is our start, our, be our beginning, but there is more to be done. The next step is to record everything that we have found. We need to know the extent and the nature of marine pollution if we want to tackle it. It's like going to the doctor. You know, you have to know what your problem is in, or, in order to be able to follow a plan, you know, to, to become well again. So we collect data extensively. We have a huge database uh, that we are using for our, for our operations in order to improve our operations, but at the same time also in order to contribute to policy making in Greece. And of course, what we find on a daily basis corroborates what we find in the European Union, plastics. Plastics dominate, so about 75% of what we find daily is plastics, so this is important. The third, the third um, thing that we do is that we support research. We not only fund research through Greek academic institutions, but also the typhoon itself serves as a basis for research um, uh, teams that a, monitor benthic litter, that is, they understand what happens at the bottom of the sea, and B, uh, test new technologies like remote sensing and how they can help us identify litter in advance. And the fourth, uh, obviously, area is awareness raising. We need to raise awareness. We know why this is important, but not everybody does. And Spiros is right in saying that we need to focus on circularity, but I'm afraid that there is a lot that we still have to do if we want to get there. So we try to work holistically. We try to do, I don't know what's going on here. It's kind of scary. Okay, so we, we need to work holistically. We need to find our horizontal solutions. And although we are now working in Greece, we are ready to, to move ahead and work in the rest of the Mediterranean as well. And also, for your very frank beginning, we're talking about it a lot. We're actually doing it. Very, very good example. And also that it is such a comprehensive approach, including critically that awareness raising. People don't really understand it, which is also effectively what we just heard from our speaker from Croatia, bringing, bringing them in. Thank you. We're going to turn to something very different now. Stefan Spiteri, who is general manager of Europa. So it's uh, responsible for funding advisory services and, and solutions to clients, uh, particularly pertaining to planning, design, management, and implementation of programs and projects from an absolutely broad, broad range of EU-funded programs and nationally funded schemes. That sounds like a job that actually really does need doing, indeed, because there is a plethora of possible funding and funding instruments. So the floor is yours. Please, for the interpreters, don't speak too fast. They need some breathing space, okay? And so do these good people's ears. Thank you. Uh, is, it, is it lit? It should be able to hear you. Try again. No, but I'll bring you a mic. No, I'll bring you a mic if we have one. Just hold on. Sometimes it's a little bit late in its functioning. We had this yesterday. Okay. Ah, this should be off. We turn off. Okay. Do you hear him? No. Oh, look, a very sad face just went no at the back there. No, I, I stay. It's okay. Thank you for the offer, though. No. No. Oh, God, I think your suggestion is the best, isn't it? Yeah, go on. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, voila. 
Oh my God, it's you. You are the curse. You are the curse. Hang on. Hi there. Oh, Hi. Yay. Oh, yay. Okay. Well, um, the initiative I'm going to present here today is actually not something that is uh, part of our work, but is an initiative that a company has taken back in 2021, where we have set, uh, launched a platform called Green Dean Malta, as you can see here on the slide. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a platform where we bring together uh, thought leaders and experts in sustainability and raise awareness within our country, within our island, about sustainability matters. Um, uh, it's a collaborative platform where we have uh, uh, ideas shared from the experts in the field, politicians, NGOs, um, uh, startups, uh, industry leaders, uh, bringing together all these ideas and sharing our, our thoughts together. Contributions as well coming from uh, within the company, as in like uh, blog posts, and, and uh, as you can see here, uh, earlier today, uh, someone did mention, uh, I think it was uh, DG, Deputy DG Joanna Drake, um, she mentioned uh, not posting on Instagram, but maybe also. So uh, here I'm sharing with you some, some posts which we have had earlier this year about, specifically about uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the pollution there. Um, uh, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, the, 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 the platform itself is, 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 a, is a collection of uh, blog posts about projects as well, which have been uh, seeking EU funds, uh, projects which have um, attracted national funds as well about research. This one is specifically about uh, a project which uh, has gathered data within uh, near shore waters within Malta about the plastic waste within, within our shores. Um, that is basically, that's basically what, what, what I have to say at the end is that basically um, we are there to spread awareness um, about how individuals and organizations can become more sustainable and how they can help in the fight against climate change. Um, and we are also hoping to assist clients in achieving their projects through our services. That's it. Thank you. You were like sort of the, the, the funding speed data. Well, you're more than that. Speed dating funding agency. You are connecting people. You are yes. getting... Yeah, and, and yes. the statistics that came from the plastic was gob gobsmacking yes, in the first yes, slide. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, the, the thing about microplastics in the Mediterranean is quite, uh, as we've seen, I think the previous speaker was saying, which is not one of the most urgent problems within um, our, our seas, but one of, one of the most, um, not the top ones, but very, very important challenge, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on, if I may, to you, Francesco, please. So you are responsible for the EU Affairs Department at the Port of Ravenna Authority. So you're managing EU-funded projects in ICT, logistic and environmental sustainability. So we heard yesterday how the Port of Ravenna is very, very active in terms of adhering to the Mission Charter. There is a lot going on there. But importantly, what he is here to talk about is the access to NAPA action, of which you are the coordinator. So tell us, uh, tell us about that, and I hope that works. Yeah, it works. Thank you very much for introducing me. Yes, uh, uh, the Access to Napa Action is a project co-founded by the Connecting Europe Facility Program. It's a project that uh, began in 2021 and will end in December 2024. And it's the participation of ports belonging to the Napa Association. Uh, that's why it has its name. The Napa Association is the association of ports uh, of the North Adriatic Sea. Just sit back a bit. Yeah. Ah, that's it. It's better? Yeah. It's no, better. you don't need to hold it. Okay. Yeah. Ju uh, voila. So, so the coordinator of the project is the Port of Ravenna, but other participants are the Port of Venice, Port of Trieste, and Port of Koper in Slovenia. 
what's the aim of the project? The project uh, aim at improving the efficiency of those ports and uh, in particular to uh, contribute to decarbonizing maritime activities. Uh, in order to do so, uh, among other activities in the ports, uh, in the project it's foreseen to design cold ironing facilities for ships that are also called the uh, onshore power supply uh, in the and at the cruise terminal of the port of Ravenna and uh, in a commercial pier in the port of Trieste. Uh, once these facilities will be in place, uh, ship at birth will be able to switch off their engines and be plugged to an electri electric uh, charging point uh, to receive energy. This uh, will have a direct uh, positive impact uh, on uh, citizens living, uh, that live near the port areas, but also on uh, uh, port workers and also on tourists and uh, cruise passengers. Uh, because uh, we will avoid uh, CO2 emissions, emission of other pollutants, and also noise. Um, as I said before, um, the Access to Napa project uh, will finance uh, uh, the design of these uh, uh, facilities. But uh, when the project will end uh, in December 2024, immediately uh, the works uh, will start. And in Italy, these works are already being financed by the National Plan of Recovery and Resilience. And this show how these, uh, uh, these investments are considered strategic uh, to um, improve uh, uh, environmental sustainability of port operations. Interesting. Interesting. For the first time, I've actually, I mean, that the, the, the facility has come up before, but to actually hear it being used in action like that. And of course, I remember when I moderated in Hamburg ports, you have such pressure, such pressure because you need to be sort of models and, and pioneers. And, and yet you cannot control everything that is happening down that, that value and supply chain. So hugely complex. Thank you very much for, for those uh, highlights into that uh, excellent project. Um, Juanita, I, thank you first of all. Juanita sent the most lovely picture with her bio, absolutely in the sea. I think you must be, were you actually deep sea diving there? It's, oh, no, no, it's not deep sea. Ah, oh, well, <laughs> <But> it's, <laughs> it's a very, very nice picture. You are head of projects at Submon, and you're gonna talk to us about one of those activities. So. Let me give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you liked the, the picture. Uh, well, we are Submon, and it's a really a privilege to be here. We are a small entity, actually, but we do a lot of things. Uh, we are based in Barcelona, and we work mainly in Spanish coast. And I'm talking today about one of the projects that we love the most, that it's about uh, the cooperation and the work we do with coastal municipalities uh, to work with this problem about uh, mooring fields over Neptune seagrass beds. Um, I, I like to define Submon as a knowledge broker. Uh, it's, it's a concept that I really like to, to define and it's something that we need now for this mission ocean. And it's linking this uh, knowledge coming from the research and methodologies and to put it into action into the environmental challenges that we are facing. So uh, this example, this, this action, I will divide it like in two parts. One is the identification of the problem and the second, bring a solution, a feasible solution that it's also very important. So the first thing that we do with municipalities when they uh, have considered that they want to work with that is to localize the concrete mooring blocks that are affecting the seagrass, the Posidonia seagrass. And after we localize and see which other elements are damaging the, the beds, we do a categorization of this damage. And then uh, after this evaluation and assessment, we provide some solutions. Sometimes solutions are not just extracting, so it has to be also evaluated. And then after we have this, the map of the problem, we come up with a solution. And sometimes the solution, as I was saying before, is not just extracting the concrete blocks because we have found that sometimes it's already integrated into the ecosystem bed. So 
Uh, when we talk about restoration, this is also that we have to, to bear in mind that not always extracting is the option. So once we have evaluated, and if the extraction is not possible, we consider the element integrated into the Posidonia seabeds. Then uh, if we can remove it, we propose to relocate it in a place that it doesn't damage the Posidonia seabeds. And if it's, this is not possible, we assess in the process of extracting these concrete blocks uh, following the normative and legal procedures and also the waste, a correct waste disposal. But it's also because imagine that these blocks are quite big and sometimes it's a very difficult. And, um, and then also we, we propose some other alternative of innovative alternatives of mooring that are low um, impact and ecological. So this is mainly one of the actions that we do. Fantastic. So what would be just one the low impact ecological, another well, alternative it, to mooring? Yeah, the, the, it's, it's the way they are anchored into the sea block. It's like in a, a crow, I, I, I don't know. It's, oh, it's, yeah, screw. Yeah, a screw. That's the, that's the thing. This, and with other um, shapes that don't damage the, 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 the Posidonia. And just the small thing I just want to say that to, it's important to close the circle and we also have an involvement that is this picture uh, with the stakeholders because in the damage areas we are uh, now trying this pilot of uh, replanting. We, still we cannot say restoration, just okay. replanting Posidonia into the damage areas with the collaboration of the citizens in this in this location in the in the coast. One last question for you, just because it's important, it ties together what we've spoken. Community engagement, just in two or three sentences, is this part of this project or is it your intention to make it part of this? No, we have already collaborated. Uh, in, for, in, for example, in this case, citizens in this town in Yansa, they uh, collect the living shots coming from storms. Uh, they bring to the Fishers Association where we have uh, tanks with water. And when the, the tanks have these shoots, uh, we, we, we go and make the replantation. Okay. And also we are now in a citizen science project with the people from Yansa to see if we are, um, if we can monitor change in the biodiversity of the space. Okay, thank you. It thank goes you. without saying, good people, to you too. If I had all day, I would happily sit with a glass of wine, beer, vodka, gin, or all, and ask you so many questions. And I really do thank you, because I know what a pain in the bum it is to have to be so concise, because you are all genuinely brilliant. Thank you very much. Could you give a very warm round of applause to these lovely speakers? Thank you. Knowledge broker. I think you're all knowledge brokers. There's lots of knowledge brokers. Right, before we have our last three speakers, please lend them your ears, your eyes and your energy. I know you have to do a bit of multitasking, but they need to see your bright faces and you are going to get lunch soon. Can we just run a poll before I invite them forwards? Can I? There it is, the last poll before lunch. The key ingredient for implementing the mission is... What is that key ingredient? What most resonates for you? Creating a community of actors who have to implement solutions together? Regular communication, not just from time to time at the outset and then we'll do something and then we'll kind of communicate. Ensuring that the absolute localist of local level of government or government in general is on board all this awareness raising, how can they help? This citizen science, this ocean literacy, this public awareness raising. What do you think has to happen first or most importantly? Okay, you're all either very good students because you've listened to the point that has come up again and again and again and again, or you came to this event with that very much in mind that none of, this, none of this works. But I think that's obvious to all of you who work on the ground and even at political level because there are so many diverse actors involved. So creating that community of actors, 
but you have to have the local authorities on board. We heard yesterday how critically important they are. So we've got a great three speakers to join us uh, here before lunch. So may I first invite Europe Jacques, from Europe Jacques Delors Geneviève Pons, who is outreach and support to the mission. Uh, a warm round of applause also. Paul Holtus of the World Ocean Council Europe as well. Hello, sir. Uh, Global Blue Economy Hub, going to bring a really interesting perspective, something that we've heard come up, but perhaps not to the extent that you're going to elaborate. And we have Julie Person from uh, Microfit. Voila, there you are, um, which is a, a, a real flagship scale project of BBI uh, JU, but you will speak and elaborate on that momentarily. So I can't decide, good people, if you've got the loveliest, easiest slot because they know they're going to be able to have a delicious lunch in Italy, or the hardest one because they want that delicious lunch in Italy, for you to judge. Um, so now, um, Geneviève, you, you, you wear so many hats, so I've had to, it's been a bit of a challenge to sort of ask you to condense everything, because there's a lot. You are Director General and Vice President of Europe, Jacques Delors, and an Honorary Director of the European Commission, and you were, of course, in charge of environment and climate matters in Jacques Delors' cabinet uh, during his last two mandates, so you have a wealth of experience. What can you crystallise for us and motivate us before lunch. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, so you understand what is it? it the one that does not... Well, ah. no, okay. Good. It's working. It wasn't pushing hard enough. So, hello everybody. I'm very, very pleased to be with you here. I am a Mediterranean myself. I was born in Tunisia. And I have a lot of Tunisian friends here. Um, so, um, wonderful place to speak about Mediterranean and to speak about ocean protection in general. Uh, you understand that my role uh, and the role of Europe Jacques Delors from the beginning of the mission has been to support the mission. I, I've been the, the representative of the assembly inside the board during the first phase of the mission and to also raise awareness of what the mission is and uh, what uh, can be done. So I have decided to speak about three projects which are very dear to me because I think they are uh, extremely important for the success of the mission. Two of them uh, are about uh, ocean literacy, are about education, and the third one is about creating links. So, the two first one about education. The first one, um, Martina Strella Di Mare, uh, which is supported by Cristina Pedicchio, a member of the board, is an extraordinary small booklet for uh, kids from three to, to six years old. And it's in a very clear and simple manner, explain to these kids why it is important to safeguard uh, ocean from plastic litter. Uh, it has, has been very successful in the board and has been translated in French and soon in German. So I wish to raise your attention to this book and maybe translate it in your language. Second, Pepper the Robot. So Pepper the Robot is supported notably by Alan Daidun, another member of the board. And um, this uh, robot uh, is able to answer questions and to interact with older children and teenagers. And it's a pleasant manner to uh, raise awareness of this population and through them of their parents and grandparents. And from the beginning of the mission, we know that this ocean literacy is absolutely key. Finally, Create Links, a wonderful project, um, Med Odyssey 2025, 
which is uh, uh, launched notably by uh, La Saison Bleu and Rim Benzina, who is here with us, but uh, who is already supported by a famous French diplomat who is with us also, Olivier Poivre d'Arvor, uh, from the chair of the Bizert uh, Forum, Pascal Lamy, who is with us, and it creates links between very different and important initiatives for the protection of the ocean. Uh, the Forum de la Mer uh, de Bizerte, uh, the Starfish Mission, uh, UNOC, UNOC 3, that France is co-organizing with Costa Rica, uh, and our Ocean Conference that will take place in Athens in April 2024. Med Odyssey will create links between all the protectors of Mediterranean and notably between Athens, June, April 2024 and Nice, June 2025. These are my dearest projects, but I must say that I have been amazed by all the projects I have heard about during this session, and this makes me optimistic. Thank you. Oh, look. Oh, you can hear me. That's good. I think it's on purpose. I think they've just had enough of me, actually. So, Paul, something interesting you're going to bring with us. Here we go. He's going to talk about the Global Blue Economy Hub, uh, the World Ocean Council Europe. So, you are working with the private sector. You're working with the market forces. You're, you're really pushing to develop these really practical solutions for achieving, achieving sustainable development and environmental concerns. I don't think I need to say more because I think you are going to articulate far better than I quite who you bring together, how, why, and the kind of the impact of that. Over to you, please. Great, thanks. <laughs> really happy to be here. Um, I'd say aloha, everyone. Uh, so I'm an ocean guy. I'm also an ocean optimist. My whole life, I grew up in the Asia Pacific region and for the last 40 years, focusing a career on the ocean and sustainable development and 25 years on the role of the private sector. I think we can all agree, uh, and I hope we can all agree, that the role of the private sector is essential to achieving a healthy and productive ocean uh, and, and achieving our sustainable development collective goals as a society and a planet. And so this is the challenge though, and, and uh, Spiros and others have, have identified this key need to engage the private sector. That's what we do at the World Ocean Council, creating that structure, that process to bring together all of the sectors that operate in the ocean. And I think the next uh, slide kind of gives a, a sense of that. Uh, the complexity of the ocean economy and who all we need to bring together. Uh, not only the business sectors, shipping, fishing, energy, aquaculture, tourism, etc., ports, but also the investment community. All of these different sectors need to be engaged together and that's what we do at the World Ocean Council at a global scale and also at a European scale. And so our contribution to the mission is to bring together that community, that business community, that investment community, the innovation community uh, at the global and the European scale. And of course, these scales interact because many of the economic players are operating internationally, but also at the European and at the, at the sea basin level. Globally, we have a network of some 35,000 industry innovation and investment contacts wow. that we bring together. Uh, and so we will be working with the sea basins to engage the community, I'd say particularly at the Mediterranean level, as we now have our global headquarters in Barcelona, uh, and a major focus on what we've been calling the Blue Economy Leadership Alliance for the Mediterranean, Bella Med, to bring together leadership companies from all of those different sectors and the investment community, um, and to be a partner, as we are increasingly, in the uh, Blue Economy-related uh, projects uh, being uh, called for and proposed uh, from Brussels 
uh, to work at the sea basin level and the inter-sea basin level, uh, as well as on specific topics uh, such as uh, decarbonization, carbon sequestration, uh, green shipping, uh, etc. Uh, finally, I just mentioned that we, um, um, we have uh, a, a couple of closing points. We have the only global gathering of the, the international business community, the Sustainable Ocean Summit. Uh, this is the ocean business community that gathers to focus on, on uh, the future of the ocean and the role of the private sector. And last year, we also launched in Barcelona the Global Blue Finance Summit, the gathering of the investment community uh, for the ocean. We are, we've just signed an MOU with the Uni Union for the Mediterranean and West Med which is having their annual stakeholder conference in June in uh, Milan, as well as their best project awards event coming up. And lastly, I would like to draw your attention to one of the most important people uh, on a global scale, but also for the Mediterranean and Europe regarding the ocean, uh, our colleague Stefan Keshkesh, who was the godfather of the Regional Seas Program. Stefan from Croatia, now retired, but he is someone people should recognize and, and appreciate the role of individuals and all of you as individuals and your work that we need to do to uh, address these challenges in the ocean at the Mediterranean, the European, and the global scale. Thanks very much. Thank you. And that's a great slide. That's, that's oh, one of the slides. I forgot, there's another one too. Well, that's, that's, that, that's a great slide for ocean literacy, for raising awareness. I think, I mean, it's a bit like when I asked the question who in the room and I said, the Coast Guard, you've, you know, the rear admiral has opened my eyes. It look just, at this, look at yeah. this one too. The footprint yep. of all of these industries that we need to engage at from the local up to the global scale. That's the one global ocean that we need to, uh, to work at with. And, and this and is just, why the mission is so important. And a, uh, for a beautiful, as you know, nutshell answer, have you seen in the last five years a change in the investment community in this sector? You know, we heard it's got to stop being a side dish. It needs to be the big, the big main dish. Have you seen any change? Absolutely. I can tell you, 25 years ago, when I was deputy director of the Global Marine Program at, at IUCN, I started reaching out to ocean industries and, um, and talking about the need for a collective uh, industry coalition and leadership on, on ocean sustainability. There's a lot of good, smart people in, in, in good, great companies that want to engage, but the other stakeholders were very skeptical of the role of business. And now that's become a more mainstream yeah. acceptance. Okay. And on the finance point specifically that you brought up about 10, 12 years ago, really started reaching out to the investment community about ocean sustainability and investment. It was, like, it was a new subject. And now again, it's really becoming mainstream, especially the last three, four years. There's some great organizations and people really seeing the role of investment okay. in really driving forward uh, sustainability and the role of the corporate sector and innovation in providing solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, uh, I could have a million questions for all of you, but I would like this lovely lady who, hey, you have the privilege of shortly taking us all into lunch, Julie Persson of Microfit. Tell us, tell us about this great project. And I hope the, you have to give it a good old push. Yeah. Yes, it's working. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Julie Persson. I'm very glad to be here because before joining the company Microfit, I was working for 10 years in the innovation on blue bioeconomy. So it's a pleasure. Microfit is a company, French blue biotech company, working on microalgaes, as you can see on the picture. So uh, we are an expert in this uh, field and uh, we are located in the south of France, near Montpellier. And we are producing natural ingredients from macroalgae for diverse sectors, nutrition first and well-being. And this great expertise coming from our uh, founders, an expert scientific expert working in IFREMER, the French Institute on Marine Technologies and Marine Sectors. And our activity relies on our cutting edge technology developed and patented by Microfit, the photobioreactor CAMARG. Next slide, please. These photobioreactors led to unlock 
the diversity of microalgae production at a large-scale production on an, industrial, on an industrial scale. That's very interesting because we can go to reach different species of, of microalgae and to reach different inter interesting targeted molecules for different application sectors. Thanks to that, European Commission and more specifically circular biobased Europe, now, before it was BBIGU, Biobased Industry Joy Undertaking, support us to become and to build, design and operate the first of its kind flagship platform on a biorefinery of macroalgae, from macroalgae to foster a blue future with different sectors of application, food, food supplement, feed and cosmetic sectors. Next slide, please. So you can see here our plant in construction. The project began two years ago and we have two years more to do it. It's a support and grant of more than 15 million euros from the European Commission. And our part for the ocean protection, what is it? First, macroalgae, thanks to the synthesis, um, techno synthesis, they are able to fix carbon dioxide to produce bioactive compounds for sectors of application. These, bio, these bio compounds will replace the petrol source compound we are, we are finding now in cosmetic industries and some food application as well. L'Oréal is a new investor of our company. That's explaining and showing you how it's in interesting for, our, for the development for us. And more specifically, macroalgae are the first step of the aquatic food chain. So we can develop new nutrition for the aquaculture sector. It's very interesting for that. So the support of the CBEGU, the European Commission, is a such kind of, in a such kind of project. It's a very example of the contribution for the sustainable blue bioeconomy. And uh, we give you, we invite you to follow the next step of our project on the scale site, on the CBU site and on Macrofit site as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Super, super interesting, absolutely fascinating project. Am I allowed to leave it there, good people? I extend the same words as I said last time. I would happily invite you all for dinner every night of the week, and I would. I am so happy to hear, Geneviève, that you have optimism. You are an optimist. Julie, are you of the generation of optimists? I am, but we are, we are very... Do, we are obliged to do things very in a hurry now. Yeah, and that's very, hard, isn't very, it? We, we. And it's hard doing things in a hurry sometimes because you need the time to create and innovate and test and see what fails. Somebody said yesterday, sharing mistakes. Yes, very critical point, sharing mistakes. Okay, we need now to share some Italian cuisine. Um, Pascal Lamy, you spoke yesterday that we would hear actions, not ideas. Are we delivering? Is this conference delivering on that actions as much as ideas? I think so. I think so. Who would put their hand up and say you've been inspired by this really, really diverse group of people who've had to distill their brilliance into but a few minutes? Thank you so very much. You can stay a minute. Um, don't forget, now, we will advise you when, because we're 15 minutes behind, how long the lunch will be. We will come and bring you up. And for those of you online, we will also, we're looking at an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, something like that. So those of you online, please be back in an hour, an hour and five minutes. You know, just take a look. And for all of you, you will be up the marble staircase at the correct moment. Thank you very much. Tweet, eat, have a good time. See you soon. Thank you. <laughs>